Hi guys, welcome back, or if this is your first time here, then thank you for joining us. This is the Doula's Guide to Dot 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 with me, Meg, also known as the Dungaree Doula. It's the podcast where we talk about all things pregnancy, birth and parenting. My aim is to share unbiased information alongside a little bit of friendly chit chat to ensure that you head into parenthood feeling confident and excited for what's to come. If you've missed the first couple of episodes and would like to know more about me, then go and check out episode one for a little introduction and a big chat on hypnobirthing and the following episodes for some great birth preparation and parenting preparation too. And if you love the podcast, you can now leave me a little tip to say thank you via buy me a coffee. The link is in the show notes. This episode, I'm chatting with Tori of Tori Louise Coaching, all about the beneficial effects life coaching can have on the way we parent and show up for ourselves and our children. We discuss societal issues which leave many of us parenting in isolation, the pressure of social media to be a perfect parent, and the guilt and shame around things like phone usage and reactionary outbursts towards our children. We talk about how life coaching tools can help us to not only better cope with all of the above, but also leave us with breathing space to build better habits and better relationships. And then right at the end of the episode, Tori guides us through one of the tools that we can use to change our neural pathways in moments of stress or anxiety to better deal with whatever has triggered that response. It's a really nourishing little segment, so make sure you stay tuned to get that into your ears. So let's get into it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Okay, hi Tori, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, just to set us all off, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Tori. Um, I am a life coach and I hold circles, new moon circles and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it now. So you've had quite a long sort of path to get here. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because obviously we connected through birth work um, initially. So how has your journey evolved from birth work or maybe even before that into life coaching? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I was uh, a teacher for 10 years before um, oh, yeah. birth work. Uh I was a teacher in Hackney in East London, um, and uh, the last five of those I was teaching and leading in the early years, Um, and I discovered hypnobirthing when I was pregnant with my eldest, and I used hypnobirthing for my, both my births, and had both my um, babies at home, and my youngest was born four days before the first lockdown uh, here in the UK. So I had gone on maternity leave with the intention that we would, I would go back to work. And like lots of people, we made some big changes in uh, lockdown, moved from East London out to Essex, uh, where uh, I grew up. And I felt like it was the right time for me to leave teaching and I have been reflecting on this actually before uh, before I was coming in to kind of talk about it today. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I always knew I didn't want to be like a lifer as a teacher, like do it for the rest of my life. But yeah. I always knew I was going to do something else um, and that my path was going to kind of shift. And when I decided to train as a hypnobirthing instructor, I think I also knew that I wasn't going to do that forever, but I was like really passionate about the births that I'd had, the education and experiences that I'd had. So it felt like kind of, yeah, a great, a great option. And I could start doing that. We were still, you know, locked down. It was 2020. Um, so I, so I did, um, and that's where we connected when um, I moved over to the birth uprising. At the start of last year, I started holding um, mother's circles, and uh, for a little bit I did pregnancy circles. But from about 
quite early last year, I actually said to um, my business coach at the time, I think I want to be a life coach. And I didn't have, like, hadn't really done much coaching. I had done some coach training with my school, like through a leadership course, um, but not in the like life realm at all. But it took me quite a long time to, you know, transition from something that I'd been putting a lot of energy into, a lot of time, money. And then towards the end of last year, 2022, it all kind of came really strongly to me. I'd signed up to a coach training. It was to start this year in 23. uh, And it suddenly kind of hit me that I, I didn't want to carry on doing two things side by side. I just wanted to do life coaching and everything kinship was going to stop and then I have now sometimes a bit of space is what you need to like decide on you know what you have enjoyed what you are enjoying and um so I have started holding new moon circles um both in Coggeshall where I live in Essex and and online as well but mainly doing coaching one-to-one life coaching (laughs) Yeah, but I feel like the circles, they fit really nicely alongside it as well. So it's, it doesn't seem like sort of out of the realm of possibility that a life coach would also be held in circles, if that makes sense. Yeah, it feels really fun. And that's like, I think I was doing the circles really regularly when I was doing mother circles. And I don't know, I, I they, individually, the circles were amazing and I love them but it felt like uh, a lot of work in the end a lot of preparation time um and energy there was quite a lot of energy expenditure to hold that space now I'm kind of doing them ad hoc and well ad hoc with the new moon but you know like I don't force myself to have one every month and things uh and it's really fun which is you know what life's meant to be I think <laughs> yeah no 100% and I think that there was two things then that you mentioned about birth like but I, it's probably the same with every business is that it is a lot of energy expenditure like with circles or with birth work you are invested a lot into people's lives and also the money like side of it as well it does cost a lot to do these trainings and to hire venues or to pay for resources and things like that so you do kind of have to go all in and I think sometimes that can be why it can be scary to make a jump to something else because you almost want to make sure that what you've done has been worthwhile for what you've put into it yeah every single thing I do like almost every day I think about how every thing that I did in building that business was worth it yeah I don't think I really I had been, I'd had coaching. I already said I had done a bit of coaching myself through this leadership course, but I also had one of my first kind of mentors now, now 10 years ago was, is now a coach. Um, and she was my deputy head at the time. So her like one kind of pivotal moment that I remember of like going through this change at work that was really hard. She was coaching me and I did that like really sticks out as a key moment in life. My head teacher is also this incredibly, she is, she's not my head teacher anymore, yeah. but uh, I was in quite a while, um, is really forward thinking in the way that she was building and growing her senior leadership team. And we had business, we, she hired a business coach and we had these this incredible like one-to-one coaching time, which, you know, is such an insightful way to kind of, spend some of your leadership budget and like investing in your you know in your team I feel like that's really helpful because it kind of puts it more into context and it leads on to what I was going to ask you next because I think a lot of people are not aware of if they've ever had coaching or ever been coached but it seems like for you it sticks out as you can pinpoint times in your life where you've really benefited from it and that does lead to the next question of what life coaching is because I think a lot of people when they hear about coaching or life coaching they have no idea what it is and they maybe think that like you can imagine being coached like in the gym or something like that but you can't imagine how that would ever be relevant to your life so yeah that kind of leads us on to what life coaching actually is (laughs) absolutely yeah so um now there is so much debate and my first reaction when I knew you were going to be asking me about what life coaching is was oh hard to explain um but it's good practice for me because I know I need to get better at explaining it. But um, interestingly, the, um, the 
certification I uh, and training that I did earlier this year, I had the choice at the end. They kind of shifted the uh, like name of the course and things. So I had the choice. I still have the choice of, of whether I wanted to be certified as a life coach or an integrative change worker. Ah, okay, that's interesting. Um, I mean, having <laughs> like having done life coaching with you, I can see how you could choose either of those titles. <laughs> I'm going to go with life coach, but just yeah. because I don't, like it really doesn't matter because no one cares about your certificate or something. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, I could call myself either. But generally with coaching, there is this idea that there's a change, a transformation, a shift that you want to make happen. And it can be with anything. And so my experience of coaching in earlier part of my life was ostensibly business coaching or like career coaching. But even with that business coach that my head had hired, we talked about life stuff. I talked about my relationship. You know, it it is almost always interwoven. And I think every business coach I've worked with subsequently, we have talked about life stuff as well, because life is life, especially if you're, you know, running a business yeah. um, rather than employee, but, but both, both two scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I've lost the train of thought. <laughs> no, I mean, it is such a big question. And I think also it probably does depend on who you trained with and the type of avenues that you are going down because there's going to be different people who are life coaches and that do completely different things to what you do. So it is, it was, oh, that was a hard question. <laughs> yeah. So I, there are definitely lots of different schools of coaching and training methods, and some are very, um, I would say like quite cognitive um and uh then there is also a kind of people have like a negative view of that a life coach has come and say like oh come on it's just about your mindset you need to just be positive and that kind of toxic positivity that we are all too familiar with has like seeps into the birth world as well yeah. <laughs> um and was not the vibe with I know yours and my, you know, teaching of things like hypnobirthing and um, antenatal education. But yeah, my school of coaching, so I trained with uh, Simone Soul and Melissa Tears, uses a like huge range of kind of tools and techniques, um, lots of tuning into our unconscious mind. So using tools like hypnosis and also a big part of it is being able to give clients things that they can go away with and use outside of sessions. So you're not building up a kind of codependency yeah. in an ideal world. You're building up somebody to like not need you anymore. Not that anyone needs you, but you're, you're giving, you're teaching skills as well yeah. as the kind of coaching that goes on within the sessions. Yeah, definitely. And I, I definitely felt that afterwards, like some of the tools are really helpful. And it's almost, I don't want to compare it this way in a negative way, but I've done CBT, so cognitive behavioural therapy in the past. And that was something it reminded me of, not that we felt like we were having therapy, but the tools that you can utilise, you don't realise how important they are until you go away in between. And it's almost like homework. And then you come back the next week and you do feel that big shift like you do with CBT in that you've had this tool that has really helped. And you're like, oh, I've got that for life now. And it's like it's a really cool thing to have because I've been using some of the things that we learn in our sessions since for completely random stuff. <laughs> and they're so helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I there are, you know, there are lots of links between some styles of coaching and CBT and, you know, nowadays people are pulling you know things that work from not taking things from nlp you know that's been a, a big uh, a big thing neurolinguistic programming um from cbt there's, there's lots of overlap with therapy as well i'm not going to get into that debate of the difference yes. between coaching <laughs> and therapy it's a like a big one but it like there are loads and loads and loads of similarities and uh, my husband is actually a psychologist, so we have talked about this a lot. And yeah, it's not, uh, they're not, you know, in battle with each other. I think um, both things are super useful, depending on what your needs are and what you want to get out of it. 
One hundred percent. Yeah, I definitely I can attest to that from from having birth. I can see there is little things that cross over or different things that you can take that apply to birth. And I remember so when we finished our coaching, we talked about what I would sort of well actually who I would recommend sort of live coaching for. And I remember saying obviously I feel like it's beneficial for everybody, but what I wanted to focus on today was something that I said in that I feel like it is super beneficial for parents and especially parents who may be busy or frazzled or dissatisfied with certain things that they're doing. So for me I felt like it was really beneficial because I'm self-employed but I'm also with my two children a lot and it was about trying to break habits that I felt like were distracting from where I wanted to be or what I wanted to be doing or when I wanted to be present and things like that so that was a long-winded way of me saying do you agree and why do you think that it is so beneficial for sort of parents or people who are in a similar situation? Yeah I think also what you like another way of saying what you just said which is I think a lot of parents find themselves in this this uh, situation is that sometimes the like, habits and patterns that you're falling into don't feel aligned with how you want to parent your own values as a person, as a parent. We are parenting in this age where we are super conscious about how we want to do things, often what we don't want to do, like patterns that we don't want to um, repeat, perhaps, even if we might decide that we don't want to, you know, use kind of rewards and punishment or something not punishment but you know like yeah I know what you mean (laughs) can't do this you do this even if we you know start out not wanting to do that we might kind of end up slipping into some of those patterns I think particularly as our children get older it is hard because we are parenting uh with with all this awareness but not necessarily with the support with the wider kind of community that makes these more like responsive and conscious and gentle methods of parenting easier because you know we're doing we're doing it all but in isolation often um or relative isolation i had to challenge myself not to say on this podcast does that make sense uh i'm trying to take myself out of it but does that make sense No, 100% that makes sense. And I think that that highlights a really important point is that it almost feels like there's even more pressure because we're in an age where we're constantly bombarded with you should parent like this, you should parent consciously, you should practice attachment style parenting and stuff because it's better for your baby's brains and your baby's development and your bond. So we want to do all these things, but the only support we've got with it is that we saw an Instagram post about it. There's no one actually helping us to deal with all of the things that you need to be able to do this. Like, we can't regulate our nervous systems. We can't go and have a bath when we need to. We can't, like, just ditch the kids and go for a weekend away. I know some of us can do these things, but probably not to the limit, like, to the extreme that we need to. And so it can be really difficult to then not fall into these habits because you're so bent out from trying to do all of these things that are in everyone's best interest that actually you end up shouting at your kid for something really stupid or you end up bribing them because you just really need to get out of the shops or something like that. Absolutely. Do you want to share like how you find it use- have found it useful like and some specifics? But I just thought I'd flip that back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, so I was going to say I'm, I'm more than happy to share one of the things that we coached on. So in the beginning, what I wanted to reflect on, I didn't fully know, did I? And it became fully formed as we spoke about it. But what I wanted to reflect on and get life coached on was how reactive I can be to my eldest. So I've got two children and one of them is four and a half, one of them's two. And so I felt that if something happened, I would sometimes just react to it in a way that I didn't want to. So something would happen, for example, like she would spill a drink and I'd be like, ah, why have you done that? And then afterwards I'd be like, it's not even a big deal. Why have I reacted in that way? So I wanted to do life coaching to try and change how I reacted in that moment. And then as we broke it down, we realised that actually it came from the fact that I hate mess and I hate cleaning up. Well, I don't hate mess, I hate the cleaning up part. And I was feeling really triggered when she was spilling a drink or refusing to tidy up or making loads of mess and then moving on to make loads more mess because I felt like it was adding to the load and creating even more pressure and more things to tidy up. And that was why I was reacting in that way. So that's what what we started with and what we ended with. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, you know, totally relatable as a 
um, <laughs> as an issue. It certainly was for me when we when we spoke about it. Yeah. Um, and what often, like, we can't really have this conversation without talking about, um, like, when you react in a way that does not feel aligned with your values of parenting, there is so often this feeling of kind of shame and guilt that comes afterwards yeah. that just grows and often it is we may have somewhere to kind of vent to talk about it but it doesn't really go anywhere it just sort of sits within us um and it, it's a habit like anything that we do with repetition and we do it again and again it is a habituated pattern in our brain and what certainly my method of coaching is about doing is creating a kind of new pathways in our brain so that we can react in new ways and so in our coaching sessions that's what we do like we are talking in ways that uh, conversationally are creating these new building new habits in our brain even just talking about things and how we want to do things does that and that probably aligns with what people have an idea about coaching like you know like that kind of positive mindset and things yeah. but I think it has to go hand in hand with some tools to actually help you not feel like you're going to completely lose your shit if your kid turns a pot of paint upside down yeah <laughs> um, but, um, and then the tools and techniques that we like the self-hypnosis templates that we did together I think didn't we yeah that and that was yeah that was that week that very first one we did that yeah, so this really aligns with anyone who has uh, done hypnobirthing with you or with me or, or anyone else will probably be familiar with that this idea that um, mental rehearsal, there's lots of research around this, when we just think of something in our brains, think of the way something's going to happen, our brain doesn't know the difference between it just being a thought and it being real life. So there's often, it often talked about, there's like been research around basketball players who like practiced a game in their minds in between session practices, games, whatever. And uh, their performance was much better than those who hadn't done that. Um, so, and when you do that mental rehearsal in a state of hypnosis, you know, like you imagine yourself, whatever it is, doing a craft activity with your kids and Yes, something gets knocked over because that's what life is like with kids, but you just imagine yourself reacting in the way that you want to. That your brain is kind of thinking like that's a real experience. It's all kind of chalking up real experiences as far as your brain knows that enable that to become the default reaction in the future. So that's something that you went away and have the ability to take yourself into trance, do those mental rehearsals with, I think, good results <laughs> yeah definitely so I did it and like I'm I'm still doing it and I think that it really helped obviously for all of those reasons that you just said like we through our hypnobirth they know how these sorts of things work and that they do literally change like the neural pathways in our brains and stuff like that so it does help you to react differently but also you kind of touched on this and this is something that I found really helpful is that I think even just talking about it and visualizing the way that you want to react to something just makes you realize how much you actually do really want to react like that so in my head when I was visualizing me not having this sort of reaction to I don't know you like you said a pot of paint tipping over um and just being like it's okay let's clean it up let's carry on with the day and it not becoming this massive thing that creates this huge guilt and shame for the rest of the day that scares my child that like derails our activity just made me realize that actually yeah putting in all this work subconsciously is super helpful but also I want to put in work consciously because I want to react like that because it's going to have positive effects on everybody and you realize that it is, it's one tiny action that you're doing can have so many sort of counter reactions that can benefit your family and your children and your partner and yourself and the way that your day goes. And I think it seems like such a small thing. And when you're a parent, all of these small things are building up. And at the end of the day, you just feel absolutely shattered and like, oh, I've been a really bad parent. Whereas actually, if you just reacted differently then it, yeah. would, it would be completely different. And it's like, these are the tools that we need to be able to do that because, yeah, we're parenting in isolation and things are hard. So when we have these tools, we can sort of make those changes quite easily, really. Like, it's not, it's not rocket science, is it? Like, once you've got the tools, you've got the tools. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, that is something that almost everybody that I've been 
coaching has said, you know, that the they're surprised at how quickly it the shift happened. Yeah. You know, it it isn't passive. Like I think, you know, there has to be a desire to want to change. And, you know, it's not that there wouldn't be a change had you not gone away and used the tools and done the hypnosis, the self-hypnosis and things. But if you are using those, if you really want that and you are putting the work in as well, that is obviously going to have such a, a kind of deeper, deeper effect. I was actually just um, coaching with one of my clients this morning and we were reflecting on what had been different for her since, you know, this was our fourth session today. And she was saying about the, she's also a parent of the young children, the kind of perspective shift in just being able to have the space to sort of choose an action, choose a reaction. And that's something that I'm hearing time and time again. And I, and I feel it myself as well in the, like, the work that I'm doing that in my head, I kind of think of it as like a zoom out. You can sort of pause and slow things down and choose how you want to react. And I think every parent can benefit from that and feels like they, you know, they wish they could do that more. Yeah. And so if you're comfortable doing so, do you want to share some of the things that you have coached parents on or that you could coach parents on just to give some sort of really good examples about the various yeah. things? Um, sure. So uh, something that I've coached on a lot is the morning. Like yeah. lots of people find the morning or tr- basically transitions in the day quite stressful. You know, leaving the house to get to school, nursery, whatever seems to be kind of like this I don't know bot- I actually like physically imagining everybody at the door getting their shoes on but like a kind of bottleneck of emotions and often feel like that's where they lose their cool yeah so that's a big one quite a bit on like a little bit of like relinquishing control with how your partner is doing it you know like oh that's not how I would do it I could do it differently or better or and yeah like letting go a little bit that I think that is what you know predominantly it's mothers uh actually it's all mothers yeah. <laughs> I've been coaching and uh, as generally you know the primary caregiver and you've been doing everything for how many months and you know the likelihood is you do know the intricacies of your baby's needs in such a attuned way I think it is hard to watch someone I'm doing inverted commas but like get it wrong but if we're honest with ourselves you know, we have got it wrong, fucked up a million times in the, like, but usually when we're on our own. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's no one, like, judging you. Um, yeah. So if you're watching your partner, you know, not handle the situation perfectly and feeling that kind of like, oh, just give, just give me the baby or I'll just do it in that moment, you know, m- most people don't want to feel like that. It re- I think it's a really normal, natural reaction. But, you know, imagine if you could just look over at your partner trying to, I don't know, struggle to get your kid's legs inside their snowsuit or wedge their shoe on and feel nothing but, like, love and compassion because you've been in that situation before. Oh, I, can I just put in there and just say that I love that and I was giggling along because I've never heard anyone talk about it, but I am so bad for doing that, even, <laughs> like, a couple of years in. So, like, I'll watch him do something and I'll go, why are you doing that? Why have you react? Or if you like, he gets, like, a little bit aggy or something. I go, why did you react like that? And he goes, I, ju- I saw you react like that to them, like, every day this week. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, did you? Yeah, I do do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much easier to uh, just shift that blame. I'm really, yeah. uh, really into this as well. So that's my own personal work. Why well, didn't go was able to draw those, uh, draw those analogies so quickly? Yeah. Uh, and you know what? A lot of this is also my own personal work. Like I am a reactive person. Like so many people say to me, mothers, I, you know, I'm, I'm too reactive. This is, you know, I am. I am that person as well and I am still, you know, making mistakes and, and learning and it's not about perfection with all of this stuff. That was something that I had quite a lot of thoughts about when becoming a life coach. I was like, oh my God, is everyone I talk to going to expect me to have my life totally in order yeah. every way? And I think the answer is no, because people want to connect with someone who's human yeah. at the end of the day. So there's so many things and also... I think that a lot of the time, some of the things, I assume anyway, because we, I know that we discussed this before, some of the things feel unrelated to parenting, but they have wider effects on parenting. And I know that you said this comes up a lot, um, is using our phones or social media too much. And that obviously doesn't necessarily 
reflect on our parenting, but it impacts our parenting. So sort of trying to change the way that we use these tools. They are tools using our phones. They can be used for good, but trying to change the way that we use them or the way that we view them can go on to have really beneficial results on our parenting or the way that we want to be with our children. Yeah, absolutely. So phone use is, again, something that comes up quite a lot and people feeling like they are mobile phones around children are are quite sort of demonized so every bit of work that I do for anyone about mobile phones involves a bit of kind of de-shaming around that because I also think you know social media phones having whatsapp etc etc all like contributes to It can contribute to feeling like less lonely, less feelings of isolation. And I I don't want to completely demonise, you know, phone use because I just don't think, I don't think it's helpful because I just think it creates, you know, creates these feelings of shame. But, um, you know, having a bit of feeling like that urge to pick up your phone is lessened and you, you know, perhaps don't need, you know, can build in habits that, again, it's, it's about feeling aligned with your values and I do know quite a few people in real life who don't have this issue at all often they're not on social media at all but like you and I we are businesses are on social media yeah. <laughs> it's part of our lives and I don't want to stop that you know I love I love connecting on social media it gives me lots and lots of joy yeah. um but do I want to you know pick up my phone less times in the day and have I wanted to work on that yeah definitely and build more healthy boundaries. And I think that affects parenting, it affects our um, relationships with, you know, partners and things. And yeah, it's, uh, it's something that comes up a lot. I'd be interested to know how you felt with after our coaching on this. Yeah, so something that you said then really um, resonated, because it reminds me of what we spoke about is that when we said, getting a lot of joy so I do get a lot of joy out of social media I mean sometimes it's a ball ache in it but a lot of the time I do get a lot of joy out of it because I like connecting with people it's how I get most of my clients like I like it when I post something I get lots of comments of people being like this was so helpful like it does make me feel good like I'm not gonna lie I put a lot of time and effort into it it does make me feel good but it was about do I need to be checking it when that's the reason I'm checking it I'm checking to see if people have liked or commented or messaged me when actually I'm with my children, I could be getting joy from my children and I'm lessening the joy that I'm getting with my children because I'm on my phone. So that was one of the things that we spoke about quite a bit and we used some tools to change. And actually I have found it really beneficial and then I have found it a lot easier. So I wanted to change it basically so that I would use my phone. I always post in the morning. I just find that's helpful because I post, try and post most days. So I post something in the morning And then I'll put my phone away and get ready. And then I'll try and not check it again until lunchtime if I'm with my kids. Obviously, like, if it's ringing or something, I'll check it. And I've found that I'm able to do that a lot easier now from using these tools and especially the tapping tool. So I don't know if actually you might maybe want to talk a little bit about tapping, obviously not in too much detail. And I don't want you to give away all of your tools either because (laughs) that defeats the point. You know what, things like... um... (laughs) I'm happy to do that. And things like tapping are, you know, they're available. They're not, they're not my, my tools. Yeah. They're available online. I, I feel like it's a really good one to like demonstrate visually. So I'm not going to do that tool today, mm. but if it's okay to talk about now, I am about to do when I actually get around to organizing it, I am going to be holding a free event kind of, masterclassy type thing where the focus is around like reducing the kind of doom scrolling or like phone usage uh so I will be teaching those tools inside of that and the recording will be available for that I haven't I haven't got any details in the diary but um that is something that's kind of coming up so yeah is that okay to not specifically teach that now but but just to allude to it yeah and what what I'll do is so when you've got that booked in is I'll update the show notes with the information on that so if people can come back to it and check it or if people listen to this in the future then have a look because it'll hopefully likely um be there then yes yes thank you so much yeah um I was trying to figure out what would be a good thing for kind of doing in a group setting and at the moment I'm just coaching one-to-one with people but there 
lots of these tools I have been incorporating into my circles and and they do kind of lend themselves to things like you know a group a group kind of online class and things because they are simple tools like I don't want to create a mystery I'm only not teaching it now because it's easier to do on a video but um (laughs) but you can google it you know it's not um I don't want to gatekeep keep the tools at all um these are really useful tools for um uh, tapping or eft is really useful for any kind of like craving or urge so it is how i would support someone who wants to give up smoking or cut down drinking or snacking on you know whatever sugary foods and things like it, i would use the same tools for all of those things because they're kind of compulsions you know yeah. nail biting hair picking pulling skin picking that kind of stuff yeah perfect okay so I'll definitely I'll leave all the links for that below when we've got them and so I think that that kind of quite nicely rounds off everything that we wanted to talk about but I know that you was going to do give us a little example of one of the tools in a minute so before we do that do you want to just let people know where they can find out more about you and about your services and life coaching and then we will go into uh, rounding off and then also if you wanted to give a little introduction to what you're going to take us through as well Sure. Um, so I am Tori Louise coaching on Instagram and Facebook, but I'm mainly hang out on Instagram. Um, so yeah, I would love to see you over there and say hi, send me a message, say hi if you'd like to. I haven't got a website yet, but I have a link tree page, which has links to various things so my um my moon circles I do all the bookings through Eventbrite and they are linked on my you know on that page as well the plan is kind of to do an online one every couple of months and an in-person one in um I'm kind of near the uh, Suffolk Essex border in the UK and that was another thing I was going to say if you have been like thinking about circles and wanting to come to one but you don't know where one is um near you a come to one of my online ones but b like eventbrite or looking on local facebook groups and things is a really great way to find them um i had never when i started running my own mother circles i had never been to an in-person circle i'd only ever attended circles online I had never even heard of them pre-covid so they are still really you know beautiful powerful spaces to attend online I used to follow loads of kind of birth workers and in Australia and see these circles everywhere and think oh I'm so sad we don't really have anything like that and delve a little deeper there are lots of wonderful witchy woo and gatherings and things going on <laughs> yeah all over the place maybe in the like living room next door to yours (laughs) yeah I agree I had never heard of them until the past couple of years and yep I so I've been to one of your online ones and I loved it I definitely recommend those but also yeah when when you start looking you realize there's loads they're everywhere (laughs) yeah they really are um and I'm really enjoying going to in-person circles around me as well like not not posting them just going along uh they are so soul nourishing just to be in those spaces and yeah really loving them 100 percent. maybe we should do another podcast episode about circles <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um oh so i forgot to say anything then about coaching so i do one-to-one coaching all my coaching is online uh on zoom um and i uh, have different things available um it's not there right now but will be very soon you can head over to my instagram and see the like how to work with me highlight um because i have different kind of packages available for if people want to just really focus in on one thing uh, over like a month or want to spread out the work and have it as kind of an ongoing thing over like over multiple months so um yeah come over to Tori Louise Coaching and check those out if you want to. The other thing I have is a email list to get some TLC, which is Tori Louise Coaching and is also my initials, um, in your inbox kind of weekly, but you know how those things go. So if you want to, yeah, click through my Instagram and join my, um, those little love notes into your email, you can kind of keep up to date with everything on there. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, all of the links will be in the show notes below. So make sure you go and check those out and make sure also, if you've listened that you let us know if you enjoyed the podcast as well, because that would be super helpful. (laughs) 
did you want to now, before we go, tell us about one little tool that might be useful um, and guide us through it? Absolutely, yes. So um, this is a, we talked earlier about these like habituated patterns in the brain um, and creating new uh new neural pathways through the like mental rehearsal we talked about through the coaching conversations if we think of these habituated patterns as little roads in our brain obviously they're not but um but it's useful to kind of think of them in this way um there are certain tools which allow us to develop that neuroplasticity that changing of our brain because they basically act as a roadblock so for instance if you are anxious about something or um I don't know, your habituated pattern is to kind of lose your cool and fly off in a rage. That one might be harder to kind of stop in the moment with these, this tool that I'm going to teach. But certainly if you're feeling anxious about something, anxiety is a, is a habit, it's a habituated pattern. So this acts kind of as a roadblock. So your brain can't go down that path. And it, if you imagine there's a roadblock in place, it forces you, your brain to go off and find another pathway, create another pathway. And I like this one because you can really use it anywhere, except I would say if you're driving, but um, you, if your listeners are like pregnant, sitting in a waiting room for an appointment and feeling stressed out, or your kids are kind of going a bit feral around you at home and you just need to like take yourself into a place, regulate your nervous system, this is a really great tool. So first of all, if you are sitting down, just kind of get yourself grounded in your um, seat or if you're standing, kind of try and balance out that weight on both feet and just choose a point on the wall in front of you and allow your eyes to focus in on that point. And once you have that, just become aware of the outer edges your peripheral vision. How far can you see to the right, to the left, and also how far above, below? And throughout this exercise, you're not moving your head or neck at all, and you're not actually moving your eyeballs. You're just expanding the awareness. See if you can stretch out that peripheral vision a little further and just without moving, allow yourself to see just a tiny slice more either side, above, below. Now, see if you can stretch that awareness a little further. Perhaps you can't see what is to either side of you now. You know where you are in space. You know where that wall is to one side. Wall or door or window to the other. Become aware of the ceiling above you. Or below. Where you are in relation to all of these things around you. Now allow that awareness to stretch right back to the space behind you, feeling completely aware of your position in the space, the wall or in the door or furniture behind you, each side of you. And just spend a moment in this expanded awareness. Noticing how your body feels. Hopefully it's feeling calm and relaxed. Because when we're in this expanded awareness, aware of our peripheral vision, we can't be in that activated fight or flight mode. It's not possible. The fight or flight takes us into foveal focused vision, looking at what's straight ahead. So this is a really useful tool for pregnancy, labour, parenthood, life forever, as you know it. When things are building up, you can 
shut up, sit back, shift out. Just allow yourself to come into that calm space. And that's it. Oh, thank you so much. That was so nice. I hope that was really helpful for people and that will always be here. So if you ever need to come back and listen to it, it'll always be available to you on this podcast. Thank you so much, Meg. This has been so fun. My first podcast appearance. <laughs> oh, you was great. It didn't sound like it was your first. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your time and your knowledge and your tools and your gifts. Um, I'm really glad that you've come and done this for us. Thank you so much. It's such such a pleasure. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Speak soon. So that concludes our chat about life coaching. And I really hope that you found it helpful and useful and feel inspired to look into these incredible tools that can truly help you to parent in a more aligned way. As I mentioned in the episode, I've worked with Tori as a life coach and our sessions have been instrumental in changing the way that I react to situations, which previously triggered the hell out of me and would sometimes ruin our entire day. So please do check out the link in the show notes to check out Tori's work. A huge thank you again to Tori for coming onto the podcast and sharing her time and her knowledge. If you have any more questions, then come hang out on Instagram where I'm at the Dungaree Doula and Tori is at Tori Louise Coaching and let us know if you enjoyed the episode. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do stick around, like, follow and subscribe or leave a little review if you don't mind because it's so very helpful for getting my podcast in front of more people. Speak soon. See you next week. Bye.